So the third myth that Nietzsche wants to topple is perhaps the most important prerequisite for our traditional concepts of right and wrong, and that is free choice. We saw from the very beginning of discourse about what it is that makes for a good life, and therefore what it is that makes for virtue and for vice, for good people and bad people, is the fact that we have control over our actions. It is the fact that we have control that therefore allows us to attribute to good people goodness and to say it is because they freely chose to do a good thing that they therefore have a good character and therefore we should admire them. Or to a criminal when we say you're a murderer but you could have refrained from murdering. Therefore you did this in a premeditated and purposive manner which therefore shows how evil you are. So you see that our traditional concepts of good and evil all rest on this idea that you could have done other than what you did, that you were in control of your actions and you self-consciously and knowingly did it. This is the supreme myth of our morality, free will. But, Nietzsche says, this is the least rational belief that we have. This notion of free will, he argues, is kind of like a lamb who blames the hawk for coming to eat them. The lamb, in order to do this, must somehow separate the hawk from what makes a hawk a hawk, their hunger for lambs. This is what they eat. This is what they do. But the lamb, in order to hate the hawk, attributes this ability to deny their hawkness. So Nietzsche is going to give two major arguments for the myth of free will. In other words, that there is no free will. It's a myth. It's an illusion that we have and that we lie to ourselves about. And the main argument is one that we see in genealogy of morals in the preface. We're going to talk about that in this segment, and then in our next segment, we're going to talk about the argument that he gives in Beyond Good and Evil, which is an argument that there's a contradiction in the very idea of free will, that free will is kind of like a square circle, something that's impossible. So how does the argument in the genealogy of morals start out? It actually starts out in a biographical way. He talks about in the writing of this book, how he had these ideas initially, and then what the, he discovered is that they continued to develop and strengthen, and that separate ideas all leading to the same conclusion began to intertwine, and he began to see the logical connections so that each of these separate strands form a tight rope, or like a tree with various roots, and that once they became tightly entwined and strengthened, they develop into this will toward truth or knowledge, which then forced his choice to write this book. He puts it like this. He says, our ideas don't arise out of us in an isolated manner. They don't pop out of nothing. They're rather like trees that grow fruit from the very nature of the tree. And he says, we have no right to our isolated yeses and knows our ifs and buts all come out of us, grow in us like this tree. So, what he's really talking about is a sort of value or desire that he found in himself, and that this value and desire is what caused his choices, and that these choices therefore flow out of him with the inevitability that apples come out of an apple tree. Now, is that the picture? of human nature that is accurate? If it is, then there is no free will. Even our notion of free will, though, admits this. Think about it. When we make choices, for example, you chose to take this class or to watch this video, don't we have to have reasons for our choices in order for them to be conscious choices and not impulses? If you did something by impulse, without reason, we're not going to call that action a purposeful action, an action under your control. 
And so therefore, when you consciously do something, you do it because you have a goal in mind. But what determines your goals? Aren't they your values and beliefs? For example, those of you who are watching this video simply out of curiosity, well, then you value knowledge, don't you? You, you want to understand yourself better. You want to understand Nietzsche better, maybe. And so you, have to, you find yourself with this desire, this value of knowledge. And it's that valuing of knowledge that is the reason why you're watching this, or part of the reason. So, therefore, our choices, in order for them to even be conscious and therefore qualified to be considered free, they have to be caused by reasons. And our reasons are always our values and beliefs. You believed that by watching this video, you would gain knowledge. And you valued knowledge, and so therefore, you watched this video. You made that free choice. But if it's your values and your beliefs that cause your decisions, then doesn't it follow that you have to be in control of those values and beliefs in order for your choices to really be under your control, for you to be free? So then you have to be able to choose your values and beliefs, don't you? Your yeas and your nays, your ifs and buts, yay. I believe it. Yes, that's true. Yes, that's right. Nay, no, I don't want that. No, I hate that. I don't value it. No, that's wrong. It's false. These you have to be able to be in control of. Or your ifs and your buts. If only I could get my degree. If only I could get an A in this class so that I could get a high GPA and get a a degree with honors, which would get me a better job. See, all of those yays and nays and ifs and buts are our values and beliefs. If I can control those, then I am truly free. If I can't, since that's where my actions come from, then I'm not free. But let's do a little experiment to show you that you don't have control of either your beliefs or your values. You don't choose them. That's not the way they arise in you. They grow up out of you, Nietzsche says. And here's how you can show that. How many of you believe that murdering someone for their money is wrong? Okay. Great. And your belief has a twofold nature to it. First, it's a belief about a state of affairs. This has a certain characteristic, murder, it's wrong. And it's also a value, right? Those of you who believe it's wrong think it's not a valuable state of affairs. You hate it. You would feel disgusted by anybody who did this. And you would desire their punishment or their pain. So you find yourself, therefore, with this belief and this values. Now, do you control it? Did you choose that belief? Did you somehow have a bunch of different beliefs and then you somehow found your set, and then you said, okay, well, I'm going to choose to believe it's wrong. Or do you rather find it that you already had this for some time, and you don't even remember how it arose in you? You had the general idea that maybe your parents taught you that, but there are plenty of things that your parents taught you that you don't agree with. So it can't be that simply your parents taught. It has to be the combination that your parents or your society taught you, and you became convinced by it. But what does it mean to feel something is true, to believe something? It's to have this experience of the reality of it. And to show you that, think of 2 plus 2 equaling 4. If you have control over that, then you can change your belief any time, can't you? All right, so now believe that 2 plus 2 equals 5. Go ahead and try to do that. I don't think you were very successful, were you? You might have been able to say in your mind 2 plus 2 equals 5, but you didn't really believe it. You didn't change your belief by uttering something that you don't believe. We plenty of times do that. You find yourself with this belief that 2 plus 2 equals 4 because you're convinced by the evidence. But what does it mean to say that evidence convinced you only that it forced you to this belief, only that it gave you a world where you had to believe that 2 plus 2 equals 4? And this is true even beliefs where you don't feel there's a lot of evidence. If you find yourself believing in God, 
it's not going to be because of the it's not going to be because you just decided if you don't feel like God God exists then there's no way that you're going to be able to say okay now I choose to believe that God exists so our beliefs come to us through our experiences maybe but we don't control our experiences and even when we control our experiences we don't control how once we have that experience we're going to react to it our feelings are going to be what they are we can't control what feelings we're going to have as a result of our experiences so maybe for example you don't believe in god because you had a traumatic event when you were a child maybe you're someone you loved like your beloved parent died and that caused you an anger and a and a feeling of injustice in the world that made you such that you couldn't believe in a good and all-powerful god well then your belief is not what you chose was it you didn't choose to not believe in god you find yourself with that belief the evidence the world in which you judge that evidence forced you to it much more with our loves most of you probably love your mother probably love her deeply when i have class i usually ask people a survey how many you love your mother cuz i want to find someone that that people just naturally love well now choose to not love her can you control that no obviously we would love to be able to control what we love because if we could control what we love then we could love the person that's good for us and not the person we actually do love and so often romance is something that we call chemistry we fall in love but that's what values are values are our loves and if i fall in love and i find that love in me and i don't control it i cannot unlove somebody even if i'd love to unlove them and i often find myself wanting to continue to love somebody but i fall out of love with them my love grows cold and so when we experience our beliefs and values we realize they're not products of choices at all they're they're experiences within us they grow out of us they grow within an environment just like a tree that grows out of soil in an environment and through its nature to its roots we have no rights to our yeas and nays our ifs and buts to isolated acts all must come together and all grow out of our previous dispositions so if our choices are to be free then they have to have reasons but those reasons are always going to be our beliefs and our values but we have no control over our beliefs and values they grow out of us like a fruit growing out of a tree and so therefore we have no control over our choices because it's these beliefs and values that cause our choices free will is it's a myth and the myth is seen the minute we examine it more closely from afar the mosaic looks beautiful but when we get close we see it's just a broken glass and it's the nature of the broken glass that shows us that it is an illusion from afar